David, thank you very much for uh, joining me in this uh, podcast. And I want to introduce you a little bit. So David Hambling is a journalist and author based in South London, specializing in science, technology and strange phenomena. And uh, you're also a physicist, right? Uh, yeah, that's my background. My degree, which was a very long time ago now, was in physics, yes. The first time we spoke was in uh, this summer, and that was when I came across a series of uh, articles written by, by you while I was researching on uh, topics re reported by Leslie Keane uh, on the New York Times. There were some articles on the Pentagon uh, UFO videos, which I then discussed in my podcast. And then we had the chat this summer uh, where uh, you told me about uh, an article you wrote on a USA Navy laser that uh, creates plasma UFOs. What was that patent about? Uh, yeah, indeed. This is it's part of a, a long-term effort to protect aircraft against heat-seeking missiles. Uh, and there's been several technologies which have been used in the past, uh, particularly flares. The idea is you eject a hot flare and that then distracts a missile uh, away from the aircraft. Or there's also towed decoys, which are laid out on a long cable. But obviously those both have their disadvantages. So the idea was to use a laser to create uh, an object mid-air that would attract the uh, a heat-seeking missile. Uh, and they use this using uh, what's known as a um, laser-induced plasma filament. And the idea is that if you have a high enough intensity laser, it can actually cause the air to glow. And you, with, by focusing the laser correctly, you can have that occur at a distance of tens or hundreds of meters away. And by using a series of laser pulses, you could create a shape midair. So uh, in the instance of the Navy patent, the idea was that you could create essentially uh, a ghost aeroplane that would look more like an aircraft than the real target uh, and would decoy uh, incoming missiles away from it. Uh, but of course, this technology would have lots of other applications in that if you, if you happen to want to create a glowing ball of plasma that looked like a UFO. So basically, you can do very weird maneuvers with this kind of uh, technology. You could have something that moves like zigzag or... Yeah, it, it, it doesn't need to obey the same laws as a, uh, as a physical object. It's more like a shadow. It, if you shine the beam of a torch of something, you can have that circle of light moving around wherever you want. Uh, it's exactly the same kind of thing. Um, but that was only the, the latest patent. The, the American military had been working on related technology for about 40 years, uh, and the Russians possibly even slightly longer than that, though they were using microwaves rather than lasers. I mean, because you are ionizing the air, then you should be able also to pick up uh, uh, maybe an infrared signal from this uh, kind of ghost image. So the thing would appear in the, in the detection systems of... Uh aircraft. Yeah, well, and another interesting thing is that, that plasma is um, radio opaque. It reflects radio waves. So you could have something that would show up on both radar and infrared imaging, uh, and which was also visible as a ball of light. So you could create something that looked very much like a, a real solid object, uh, except there's really nothing there, and it can just appear or vanish, uh, as UFOs tend to. <laughs> so this would be something of, something of this world rather than out of this world. Very much so. Uh, I mean, there's an even more bizarre version uh, of this they worked on, uh, which is known as sometimes called the voice of God, um, because it's not a, uh, a continuous ball, because it's actually a series of flickering uh, plasma that comes and goes. Uh, and every time it appears, you get a, a slight sound. And the idea was that by modulating the frequency that it appears, you could actually carry modulated signals. So you could have a human voice being carried by it. Uh, so what you have is effectively a talking fireball. Uh, and in the very original idea of this, uh, and this is going back about um, 30 years, um, the idea was to overawe people uh, with this who'd, who'd think that it was something spooky or supernatural. Um, but it's actually, there is now a version of that which has been uh, developed by the uh, US Marine Corps uh, as a, a means of conveying voice commands to long range that they've demonstrated. It's not very good, but it shows what the technology will ultimately be capable of. That's amazing if you want to be a cult leader. Uh, yeah, I think there's, that's the, the kind of thing they might have had in mind. Uh, so you also spoke about uh, other instances of uh, uh, unidentified uh, objects. And there have been reports of UFOs flying around restricted areas, such as nuclear power plants. 
And you wrote an article about uh, a case of uh, five or six uh, drones flying over uh, the Palo Verde nuclear power plant in the US. And that was in September 2019. Now, the strange thing yeah. is that these drones were flying longer than 30 minutes, which is weird for uh, commercial drones. So what do you think was happening there? Uh, well, from the size of them, they were reported as being uh, more than three feet across. So these are obviously much bigger than the normal consumer drones, but well within the size range of commercial drones, the sort that are used for carrying cameras. Um, but rather than just being a few hundred dollars, drones like that are several thousand dollars. And clearly someone had the money to be flying a fleet of those uh, over Palo Verde. They hung around and they apparently surveyed the place for something like half an hour, and then they went away. Uh, and the security forces were unable to ascertain where they'd come from, so we have no idea who is behind that. Um, but the equally strange thing was the next night they came back and did the same thing again. That's not the only nuclear power plant that's been. There's uh, The Freedom of Information uh, Act requests have shown that there have literally been dozens of incursions like that, sometimes with one drone, uh, occasionally with uh, three or more at the same time, over nuclear power plants all across the US. Uh, and the vast majority of these are unsolved and nobody knows who's behind them or what they're doing. So maybe it could be some, some other uh, adversary power trying to test uh, the security of these uh, facilities? Or... A, a lot of people assume it's the, some uh, arm of the US government who's uh, carrying out its own test just to see what happens. Um, but it, it's clearly someone with money, so it's not just uh, a, a few hobbyists messing around because it's a lot of drones, it's a lot of expensive drones, and it's all the way across the US. Um, so there's clearly something rather bigger going on. Uh, though inevitably, uh, I did actually have someone e email me and say, no, they're not drones, they're UFOs. <laughs> so it would be a sort of a penetration test if you are talking about uh, network security. Yes, and exactly. Cyber security. It, it, it could well be something like that. Uh, and one of the curious things is that the, the nuclear authorities have said that there is no threat from the drones. Uh, they are doing very little about taking additional security measures. They don't seem bothered at all because their theory is that um, nuclear power plants are corrected by, protected by several feet of concrete. Uh, so they don't see that there's any real danger, which may turn out to be a very naive view. We are talking about drones, but uh, there are different types of drones. You can have uh, flying drones, you can have uh, drones on sea, on land. How would you define a drone? What's a drone? A lot of people don't like the term at all, but uh, you could use it to apply to any unmanned or remotely controlled system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you wrote a great book. I read your book called The Swarm Troopers, How Small Drones Will Conquer the World. It's a great work. And you make some very good points about uh, military drone technology and future developments. Can you briefly tell me what was this book about? At the moment, the drones are beginning to have quite a significant impact on warfare. At the moment, the chief users are the US Air Force and the CIA, who've been using them for what are called counterinsurgency operations. So that's very low-level conflicts where you're dealing with insurgents and terrorists. Uh, that's well short of uh, an actual hot war. Um, but the, we've also seen very recently in Nagorno-Karabakh where there have been drones making a significant impact on the, the battlefield and a, a full-scale war. And that's kind of likely to happen more in the future. Now, the, the big drones like the Reapers that the US Air Force use uh, go for $20, $30 million a piece, whereas small drones like the consumer drones made by DJI, the sort that you can buy over the internet, um, those are only a few hundred dollars. So you could literally buy tens of thousands of these uh, for the cost of one Reaper, and you can do a lot of damage with 10,000 small drones. Yeah, so you mentioned the Reaper. You said it's very expensive. I mean, a Reaper would cost, uh, I think you said, you mentioned 20 millions, can be even more than that. So it's about a third or a quarter of an F-35 fighter jet, right? Uh, I've had some interesting discussions with uh, General Atomics who make it about what the exact cost is, uh, and it does get very complicated, um, but uh, somewhere well over that. And uh, I haven't, the UAE have just bought some. Uh, I would have to check how much they're paying a unit, but I bet you it's a lot more than 30 million a time. And I guess you can customize them depending on what your needs are. 
Uh, yes, and that doesn't make them any cheaper either. What's the state of the art of uh, drones, uh, big drones at the moment? Uh... Um, so the big drones, something like the, the MQ-9 Reaper is uh, about the, the most advanced thing there is out there. Um, in terms of military aircraft, it's very low performance. Uh, it only goes at about 300 miles an hour. It's not stealthy. Uh, it's, it's really more like a, a World War II aircraft in terms of performance. Uh, but what it really has got is endurance. It can circle over a target area for a very long time with an endurance of 40 hours or more. Now, going ahead from this, they're looking at um, stealthy jet fighter type drones, but that's still some way ahead. And in terms of cost, I mean, you can uh, keep improving and improving these uh, these drones until they get so complicated and so expensive that basically there was a guy that uh, wrote a set of uh, sets of uh, rules. These are yeah, Augustine's laws, yes. <laughs> By 2054, the Air Force and Navy will only be able to afford a single aircraft between them. Uh, and in many ways, his, uh, he works uh, on both sides of the uh, defense business, both as a contractor uh, and for the military. And he saw that there is this inexorable rise of price of military systems, that uh, the, there is a tendency for them to just shoot up in price, uh, partly because the government will always pay and there, there's no incentive to keep costs down. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that that's in stark contrast to consumer electronics, uh, where things do tend to get cheaper over time. Uh, and you can now you get increasingly more capability for the same price year on year. Uh, and when you compare those two things side by side, um, one of them is going to tend to lose. And uh, I mean, there seems to be a solution to this uh, large and expensive uh, hardware. And in fact, rather than focusing on the development of uh, single offensive and highly sophisticated machines, uh, there are people talking about uh, distributed approaches. You wrote an article about this uh, this talk. There was a talk by Timothy Grayson from DARPA where he spoke about uh, mosaic warfare. I use this uh, mosaic as uh, opposed to jigsaw. So can you tell me briefly what's this concept of uh, mosaic warfare and distributed approaches? Um, the idea is that you can have your uh, war fighting capability, and it, but particularly for him what he's talking about uh, is sensing, so that's the ability to see what's happening, cameras and radar and other sensors, uh, and your communications and then your weapon systems rather than having it uh, all in one big box, like, say, uh, a single aircraft flying overhead. You could have lots of different devices at different levels. So you could have unmanned sensors on the ground, you could have small ground vehicles, you could have small drones, uh, and you could have larger systems orbiting overhead. Uh, you can build up this whole collection of things, uh, and then depending on the mission, you can slot in more at whatever level of, are needed. So you can have more radar sensors or more thermal sensors or more acoustic sensors. Uh, and like a mosaic, you can build it up to match whatever the particular mission requirement is. And instead, the jigsaw, that's a very... It's not flexible at all because you can only place a piece of jigsaw in a... The problem is the pieces only slot together in, in one way. So if you, you've got to have this piece and then you've got to have this piece, whereas with Mosaic, everything is... It's like open source. Everything can plug into everything else uh, and it all networks very tidily. And that gives a lot of redundancy. So if you lose one bit of it, you can work around that. Whereas with a, a jigsaw... When you lose one piece, the whole thing's ruined. I think one of the main problems with this uh, mosaic warfare is that uh, when you have different pieces of hardware, it's very hard to make them communicate to each other because they have a communication infrastructure, the software, that um, that is very different. It's not done to communicate uh, with other hardware pieces. For example, you, you can have the situation where you have two airplanes made by two different companies and there is no way they can talk to each other. Uh, and unfortunately, a certain amount of that is because that's the way the aerospace industry works. Uh, as with computers, nobody there wants it to be open source because what they would much prefer is to lock customers into buying their equipment. So once you buy the aircraft, you have to buy all the ground communications equipment to go along with it. Uh, and then you, you're incentivized to buy the missiles from the same company because the missiles can talk to the aircraft uh, and everything else goes from there. As soon as you go open source and have everything communicating to everything, uh, it destroys their whole marketing strategy. 
The problem then if you have open source is also that uh, you might be able to hack these systems, isn't it? Uh, it shouldn't, so long, so, so long as you've got decent, um, a decent firewall between you and the outside, uh, it doesn't, shouldn't really make any difference. Um, but security is a huge issue, uh, and that, that does tend to uh, lie at the centre of uh, a lot of drone communications activities. So basically the concept uh, with this distributed approach is that you, instead of having big uh, devices, uh, big uh, airplanes, big whatever, you could have smaller devices that uh, work together and that are, uh, I mean, you can dispose, you can sacrifice one or two or ten or whatever. The system will still work, you spoke about that. And uh, another s similar concept is also the ocean of things. Uh, the ocean of things is a, a, a program by DARPA, uh, as, and that's a very distributed sensing approach. So again, rather than having one or two large sensing devices, uh, the idea is that you have thousands of these floats uh, which are distributed across the ocean, and each float has a number of sensors on it. It's um, mainly it's it's like a floating mobile phone because it's got the mobile phone type capabilities in terms of having GPS and communications and a camera and a tilt meter and things like that. But it's also got uh, an underwater microphone on it, so it's able to uh, detect any vessels going by. It's able to see things under the water. That it will not communicate with the other floats nearby. One of the things, one of the unusual things about the Ocean of Things is that all their data is going back to a satellite. They're not networking it because they found that was too power hungry. So the, all of the sensors in Ocean of Things uh, bounce their signals back to a satellite. And then a cloud server puts together all the data from all of them and builds up a picture about what's happening on uh, above and under the ocean. And you also wrote about another type of uh, underwater device that uh, works more or less as an RFID, but using uh, uh, sound waves. Using sound rather than radio waves. Uh, yeah, this is that's a, a new backscatter device. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is that it's basically harvesting the ambient sound from the ocean, um, the, the acoustic background noise. And it's then using that to charge its batteries and also to transmit signals out. So it's a batteryless system. It doesn't require any external power source. It's just powered by the ambient sound. Uh, and that makes it very rugged and very reliable. In theory, it means it can sit on the seabed or on a float indefinitely and just keep on working. And again, that can be used for communications and you can network a load of them together to communicate over a long distance. And you can use those as sonar sensors. And because they can be made cheaply, the idea is that you could sow the sea with many thousands of these and they would all connect up and they would then uh, combine to produce an image of whatever was traveling around uh, on and under the ocean. And you can use them for multiple purposes, for example, monitoring uh, the sea temperature for climate change. You can use it to monitor the animals in the, in the sea, not only for military purposes. So there are multiple applications for this. Absolutely. And that's one of the big arguments for Ocean of Things as well, that it will be collecting a lot of uh, weather and oceanographic data and uh, DARPA are making efforts to make sure that all gets shared with uh, scientific organisations across the world. They're making that all very open source, which in one sense is very nice of them, but in another sense uh, it gives perfect cover, so it uh, allows them to put their sensors everywhere and say, no, this isn't really uh, military spying on you, this is just harmless scientific sensors. Uh, which, interestingly, is something that the military have been doing for a very long time. So there is a long history of uh, military technology being transferred to, to civilian applications. Th there is th that yeah. as well, but there's also a long history of the, the military using, for example, in the 1950s, uh, they sent balloons with cameras floating over the Soviet Union, which they claimed were just uh, for sensing cloud formations and weather monitoring, <laughs> um, but which were actually trying to take pictures of uh, Russian nuclear installations. So the opposite in this case? Um, well, not totally dissimilar. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you tell me what's the advantage of uh, having uh, small, portable and cheaper drones for military applications? If you're a soldier, one of the things you always want to know is what's happening on the other side of the hill. Uh, and because the last thing you want to do is actually stick your head up and go over and get shot at uh, while trying to look. 
whereas drones give you the perfect way of seeing everything that's going on around you. You can send a drone up and it can then take video of everything in the surrounding area. You can send it over obstacles, you can send it to the other side of the, the hill, you can look over walls, you can look down streets, you can look on top of buildings. So small drones are extremely handy as a means of seeing where the opposition is without them being able to see where you are. Uh, and that's extremely useful. And that's why uh, some military are producing their own drones and some, uh, as the Israelis are, are simply buying commercial drones and issuing them to infantry units to give them their own organic uh, air reconnaissance units. So, th And that's a way so that even at the, the lowest level, soldiers can uh, have their own aerial reconnaissance. So what do we have at the moment? What are the, the best uh, small and portable military drones? It depends who you mean by we, but one of the the most commonly used by the military uh, is the uh, Raven drone used by the US Army. Uh, and that's a lot more expensive than uh, a sort of small quadcopter. But uh, it, it looks like a model aircraft. It's got a, a wingspan of uh, a bit over a metre and that can fly around for about an hour and a half. And as well as a camera, it's got a, a thermal imager, so it can get um, images of what's happening even at the dark or through fog or smoke. The one you just mentioned, I guess it's a it's a glider. It's a glider drone. Uh, well, it's 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 a it's a powered it's a powered glider. Yes. Effectively. Yeah, so there are different types of drones. There are quadcopters and we are more familiar with the quadcopters because those are the commercial ones basically. But those ones can only fly for let's say 30 minutes or so. That yeah, that's about to, for a uh, yeah, for a consumer quadcopter uh 20 30 minutes is is usually about the the maximum uh whereas a, a fixed wing one can fly for several times longer and also quite a lot faster. So uh, it, it gives it considerably more range and endurance. I mean, if we want to improve the flight time of these uh, quadcopters, what do you think we should do? Um, there's, uh, the problem is with, a, with any kind of helicopter type device is that unlike a glider, it, it has to work very hard just to stay in the air. Uh, so it's, it's got to constantly shift a lot of air. Uh, and that makes it inherently quite inefficient. Um, so the, the ways around that uh, are mainly to just find ways of recharging it. Um, so one of the, the most common things used is uh, a drone in a box stripe solution. Uh, there are several of these uh, out there at the moment. Uh, there's an Israeli company called uh, Arion uh, produces some, a very effective one, and that is uh, effectively a base station on the ground that the drone can land on and recharge itself automatically. So rather than having a very long endurance, it, it can just um, keep coming back and recharging itself. And there's a number of projects as well for vehicles that the, uh, so you'll have a ground vehicle with several drones so that it will launch one drone off. Uh, when that one runs out of power, it'll send another one off to cover the same area and the first one comes back and recharges. So you have this constant stream of drones going out there. So it can maintain a, a drone eye in the sky indefinitely, even though none of the individual drones have that long of an endurance. Or you could work with the power uh, type of power that the drones use. At the moment we have uh, uh, batteries, standard lithium batteries. But uh, you wrote an article where uh, you mention uh, a CIA project uh, Aquiline. Uh, we're in the 70s that we're planning to use drones propelled by nuclear batteries. Yes, I mean, that's uh, ultimately, that's one of the uh, best ways of powering aircraft. I mean, you have to remember this is uh, back at the time they were also looking at nuclear-powered bombers uh, and various other things. Given that the military already have nuclear-powered submarines and nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, uh, it didn't seem quite so outlandish. The, the nuclear-powered drone would be a slightly different prospect, though, because um, there's much greater chance of it crashing and, and problems. Uh, however, there is actually a company that's working on a similar concept at the moment uh, who believe that by using uh, beta voltaics, which is a, uh, a sort of power system driven by radioactive decay, they can get uh, enough power to um, have a, a compact power system to drive a drone. So the idea isn't completely dead. The problem with these uh, nuclear batteries is that uh, they are not very efficient. That, that's my understanding. I'm not an expert, but they are not very efficient. I think the efficiency is something around 
six, five percent or something like that. That's certainly one of the problems. Um, nuclear batteries, there's only a tiny, tiny handful of applications that they're actually used for. They're used for satellites and space probes. Um, the Russians uh, bizarrely use them for lighthouses out in um, very <laughs> um, distant locations out in Siberia, um, which didn't end well. One of them got attacked by some people who were scavenging for scrap metal. So the Russians then had to track down some highly radioactive material that had been stolen when they uh, stripped this place. Drones, different drones have different uh, capabilities. I mean, if you if you think about a fixed wing drone, it can fly for a long time, but uh, the amount of maneuvers that it can do, it's, it's very limited. But if you think about quadcopters, quadcopters can go through, through trees, they can go inside the forest, they can go in, even inside houses and buildings. But now they're trying to expand these capabilities and build uh, thing, things like uh, perch and stair drones, like uh, Spider-Man drones. With uh, quadcopters, yes, you're quite right. The, the ability to go inside buildings and to maneuver around indoor spaces uh, is a, a key advantage. Uh, and that's not just for the, the military. Uh, I recently wrote a piece about uh, drones that are being used in mines and they're being used to travel through old mine workings and spaces that are unsafe for human exploration. Um, but you can have a drone that can wander around and map and see there and test the gases. And one of the things is because there's no radio communications underground, the drone has to be smart enough to be able to find its way and explore autonomously. Um, and then, as you say, perch and stair, that's a, a good way of coping with the limited endurance of a quadcopter drone. Um, by simply finding a flat surface and sitting there, it can remain as a, basically like a, a fixed CCTV. Uh, and that way it doesn't actually use any power. And you could also have sensors to see maybe what's happening inside the building, what's happening inside the room. Uh, yep, there are indeed some. There's uh, through-the-wall radar. Um, which allows them to basically pick up movement on the other side of a wall. Uh, and the there's so-called life detection radar, um, which is actually triggered by a heartbeat, so they can see whether there are living people inside. One of the uses of this would be in a, uh, an emergency situation, so you could tell whether they're people who needed rescuing inside a burning building. Uh, obviously, the military are also very interested in this as a means of determining whether there are potential insurgents uh, or other people inside a building that they're planning to clear. And there are also other types of uh, drones uh, combined with missiles, the so-called kamikaze drones. There's a switchblade 600, if I remember well. Um, yep, the, the switchblade has been around for about 10 years, which is used by uh, American special forces. It's a, a small tube launch drone. Uh, you fire it from a little thing um, like a, a bazooka, but it's very small. It only weighs a couple of kilos. Um, and that after launch, it pops out wings, and that can then fly around, again, beaming back video, and you use it to locate a target. Uh, and when you do find a target, you line it up in the crosshairs and press a button, and the drone then locks in on that and crashes into him uh, and destroys it with a target with, with a uh, warhead, which is basically like a hand grenade. Okay, so I'd like to talk about a little bit about uh, China. Uh, so China is a big topic. Uh, it has been a big topic since the beginning of uh, the trade war with the US. There are tensions in the Pacific Ocean, and also more recently with the with the pandemic. Uh, so the predominance of uh, China, I mean, in terms of uh, commercial drones, and also military drones. Do you think it represents a, a risk uh, for, for the West? Um, I think it, it represents a problem uh, in the sense that because these drones are very cheap and convenient, um, a lot of militaries have been using them. And also a lot of insurgents have been using them. The, the, I think the biggest surprise uh, was when the uh, ISIS insurgents started using Chinese drones to drop grenades on Iraqi and American forces in Mosul. Obviously, anyone can use them. It's very advanced technology. It's very convenient. Uh, but the problem is that DJI, the company who makes these things, um, is essentially answerable to the Chinese government. So any data that gets picked up by those drones, DJI may be able to hack. DJI may be able to tell where drones are. There is potentially a huge, huge security risk there. Um, so the American government, among others, 
uh, has told everyone to stop buying DJI drones while they try to find an alternative. So, yeah, I mean, there were similar problems with the Chinese mobile phones and about the data breach and the, yeah. Exactly, and there's the same issue about whether whether it's safe for Huawei to be part of our national communications infrastructure, um, because in theory the Chinese government could uh, demand that Huawei cooperate with them. Parrot was recently selected by the USA Defense Innovation Unit as a major drone supplier. Well, yeah. they've selected a whole load of them. They, they've now opened up a, a new standard called Blue SUAS, okay. uh, which is SUS is small unmanned aerial systems. Uh, and the idea is rather than being relying on a, a, a single supplier, they're going to have uh, just a uh, uh, basically an open source system which all different suppliers will produce hardware that will fit into. Um, so it's it's a sincere effort to get themselves out of this historic problem of being locked into large military contractors. And one of the big problems is that unfortunately none of the companies involved has anything like the industrial clout or the R&D base or the experience of a company like DJI. I think when in the West, uh, in let's say USA or even UK, Europe, we have capabilities to build high, highly sophisticated uh, small drones. I think the main problem is uh, uh, the cost of labor and maybe procurement. I mean, Chinese can uh, leverage the very cheap labor cost and they can procure materials and uh, electronics so easily because everything is made there. I mean, if you think about Shenzhen, everything is there. Yeah, yeah. one of the big advantages of, of building in Shenzhen is that they are close to lots of other Chinese electronics companies. Uh, and DJI, from the start, they realized that the best way to do it was rather than just building a drone and then sticking a camera onto it and sticking communications onto it was to have everything totally integrated. So they were able to go to manufacturers uh, and they actually have chips that are specially built to their specification for their drones by chip makers. And that's partly because they're doing it in such huge volumes because they're ordering a million at a time uh, and partly because they are closely integrated under the Chinese system. Uh, so they, they've got companies who they can work with them who they, they know and can trust. And it's very difficult to get that outside of China. Uh, and equally, right from the start, they threw a huge amount of research on it. DJI has about 1,500 people in their research and development department, um, which is just massively greater than any small startup is ever going to be able to match. Yeah. Do you fly drones yourself? Are you a drone pilot? Uh, I'm not a real drone pilot, no. I'm yeah. I just fly the occasional toy drone. Yeah, I've got uh, an Inspire one here. Okay, how, how have you found it? The thing is that, I mean, when you get DJI drones, uh, if you if you are interested in uh, filming and all these things, you can get, uh, I mean, that, that's the best stuff you can get out there. I mean, you can get, now you can get an Inspire 2. Uh, with the Inspire one that I have, you can uh, film uh, in 4K RAW 12 bit. With the Inspire 2, you can even film with better cameras. I think they even have full frame sensor. And uh, you can use this stuff for films. And if you want to go for something better, you can go for a Matrice 600, if, I, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and you can mount a red camera, you can mount a big Canon camera there. But if you go for Parrot, there is nothing like that. That's the problem. No, I, and uh, I think Parrot will have trouble competing with them in the open market. I mean, it's interesting that their nearest American competitor, 3D Robotics, uh, went out of business or went out of the drone business several years ago. Uh, it's just very difficult to compete with people like DJI. The only thing I found annoying was the customer uh, service, which is totally rubbish. That's totally rubbish. Yeah. But they are a huge success because they do they give you a capability which people just didn't have before. Before, the only way you would have to get that kind of shot would be to rent a helicopter uh, or in some cases to, to rent a crane. And those are just fantastic amounts of money. Whereas these days, uh, the world is full of uh, amateurs who are able to shoot these incredible um, movies with uh, overhead imagery and, and drones flying over buildings and through forests and... and other things which would simply be impossible without this type of technology. Have you heard about uh, those people doing experiments on insects to control how insects uh, fly? 
Um, yeah, this is the American military have been pursuing this for quite a few years. It it's, all looks fairly gruesome, but part of the idea is that uh, you can uh, insert a microchip controller into a chrysalis, and then uh, as the adult insect forms, you could, the uh, chip will have connections inside its brain, uh, and they have been able by using electrical impulses to steer an insect to the left, to the right. Uh, it's not exactly remote control, but it, it gives some idea of the, the kind of thing that they're after. Um, it's all, all at a fairly basic stage, um, but it's a, an indication of an interest more than anything else. I don't think there's uh, any, any actual capability out there. What's more interesting in some ways uh, is what's known as biomimetics, which is copying biological systems for drones. So all the way far as back as the 1970s, the CIA developed a drone which was essentially a copy of a dragonfly, uh, and that was able to fly and carry a camera. They didn't know how the aerodynamics worked or anything, they literally just copied a dragonfly. Similar approaches have been used more recently, and they're getting a much greater understanding of how the, the flight dynamics work. Um, but in some cases, you're seeing quite a convergence. Uh, so you're now looking at drones that look a lot more like living things. Uh, in China, allegedly, the government does use spy drones that look just like birds. Um, but given how much the Chinese government spies on its population anyway, I'm not sure whether that's really necessary for them. <laughs> okay, yeah. In terms of unconventional drones, there are also other types of unconventional drones, like uh, boat drones or USVs. And I think you wrote an article about uh, USVs operating in uh, Australia, but then there were also USVs uh, operating in Iran, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of people on our... Um, similarly with aerial drones, the technology is now there, so it's now possible to exploit that. Uh, so you can have something that can do a mission which would previously have taken a, a manned boat with several crew, uh, which is an expensive piece of kit with a lot of running costs, uh, and you can just have a small unmanned boat doing the same task and sitting out there in the ocean um, for days or weeks or months to do the same thing, and then communicating back generally via satellite. So that's a capability you're seeing not just with America and Britain and China, but also uh, with all sorts of countries like Australia and Turkey and, and Israel. Uh, and in the very near future, everyone is going to have their own robot boats. And uh, so before you mentioned, uh, so in terms of unconventional drones, uh, drones by, used by terrorists, you mentioned uh, the ISIS in Iraq uh, trying to retrofit uh, the, I think it was phantom drones with the grenade uh, drop systems. But uh, there is also the case of the Houthis from uh, Yemen who successfully attacked uh, Saudi Arabia with uh, homemade drones. Yep, the uh, Abcake oil processing facility in Saudi Arabia was uh, effectively put out of action uh, by an attack by 20 or so of these essentially garage-built drones which came from the Houthi rebels in Yemen. They clearly had a lot of help from the Iranians uh, and there was engineering and support from that side. But these are basically very crude, very cheap garage-built devices um, that are capable of carrying out a strike over hundreds of kilometers uh, and doing tremendous industrial damage. And that was a bit of a wake-up call as to just how much of a threat they were, particularly because the facility was defended by some very modern air defenses which completely failed to deal with the attack. Yeah, the system like, uh, I mean, in Israel they have the Iron Dome, um, an Iron Dome wouldn't be, wouldn't be effective against these uh, small drones. I don't think so, because those are too small probably, isn't it? Iron Dome is actually one of the better ones. Iron Dome is, is quite well geared up to uh, deal with a, a range of different threats. Um, but something like the American Patriot system, which was one of the ones they had at Abcake, um, it's only really geared to deal with fast, high-flying threats and threats like cruise missiles. Something that's very small and slow uh, and looks like a bird on radar, uh, it wouldn't be so good at, and that's one of the big problems they're having. So what do you think, what, uh, what, uh, what would be a, an effective strategy to, to disarm small drones trying to cross a border? What would you use there? Well, there is a, 
you might say a mad scramble among the defence establishments of the world at the moment to come up with uh, effective counter drone defences, particularly in in what they call class one, class two, uh, these very small quadcopters uh, and fixed wing drones. The problem is that they're actually very difficult to shoot down um, because they're very difficult to see uh, with just with a, a machine gun or a rifle or something like that. Uh, it's possible to shoot them down with missiles, but missiles are very expensive. Uh, on one occasion, we believe the Israelis did take out a small quadcopter with a $3 million Patriot missile, <laughs> uh, which is clearly not a, a viable long-term approach. Yeah. Um, j- jamming is very effective because all you need to do is break the link between the operator and the drone. Uh, and with the DJI ones, they will normally automatically return to base. But if you also jam the GPS so it doesn't know where it is, uh, it will just land softly on the ground. So jamming is actually quite cheap and quite effective. And there's a lot of these uh, drone gun things being marketed for defences uh, for this kind of low level threat for something that's simply a commercial drone using standard radio communications. Um, but that type of jamming tends not to work against military grade drones, which have got um, much more robust communications which can't be blocked that easily. Um, then moving up from there, you're, you're then moving to the, the really advanced stuff. And two of the ones in the pipeline are high-energy lasers and high-energy microwaves. Um, there are a lot of laser systems out there. Uh, in a sense, this is a godsend to them because we've had lasers for um, 60 years now, but they they haven't actually managed to reach power levels that can do any damage to a, a tank or a ship or an airplane, but they are powerful enough to shoot down small drones. So there are lots of 10, 20, 30 kilowatt systems out there which are being marketed as anti-drone systems. Uh, and they do a very good job of that, and they have very high precision deliver effects at the speed of light, and they are quite deadly against small drones. Um, but they are extremely expensive and there's a real question as to uh, how many drones you're going to be able to shoot down before they overrun you. And uh, the, the the advantage of uh, directed energy weapons is that you don't need to reload them, you just need the power. No, yeah, you, you've got an infinite number of shots. Yeah. Uh, it's extremely accurate, so it's a lot easier to shoot down a target two kilometers away than it is uh, with the machine gun. Uh, the ammunition is extremely cheap, costs nothing. It can be linked to a radar or other system to give you very high precision. Um, so the, and there's very little, unlike um, bullets, there's very little risk of collateral damage. One of the systems the Americans use is a thing called Phalanx, which is a 20 millimeter rapid fire cannon, uh, which is very effective against. Um, things like missiles, but the problem is it, it fires a, a spray of these 20 millimeter bullets into the distance, uh, and those are going to ruin someone's day if they land anywhere near them. Whereas with a laser, it only hits what you aim it at, uh, and it shouldn't do any damage beyond that. So let's talk about uh, swarm drones, and what are the current capabilities of the West in terms of uh, swarm drones? Uh, a swarm is simply a, a large number of relatively simple units that are able to carry out complicated, coordinated actions just by following a few rules. Um, Swarming technology is, a lot of it draws from nature, so this is from the way that flocks of birds fly or that shoals of fish swim, so they can all move together without crashing into each other, uh, and the whole thing can change direction smoothly and seamlessly, so it's that sort of approach. The advantage of a swarm is that you can have a hundred or a thousand or even more small drones uh, all carrying out a task, and they don't require hundreds or thousands of operators. You just need one operator to say, go over there, and the entire swarm can then obey commands. So it's got a huge potential for uh, allowing the deployment of what the military call mass. It means you can have large numbers. So it means you can have large numbers of drones um, but with very simple command. Uh, so that's quite appealing. So what are the technical challenges in the development of uh, swarm drones? Um, this is, it's getting smart enough swarming algorithms and the, the way the command and control works um, is quite tricky. Uh, so particularly if you want a subswarm to break off uh, 
and go off and do something else, or if you want to have a, a second swarm join in and become part of it. Uh, so the, the swarm interface is a big challenge there as to how humans can effectively deal with it. Um, but there are um, you see a lot of these drone light shows at the moment um, using 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 drones. That, that's not actually a real swarm because that's all centrally controlled. All the drones there are getting their orders from a, a central controller. Uh, real swarming is where each of the drones is independent and is making it up its own mind um, just based on what its neighbours are doing. That's a bit trickier. Um, but the technology is moving fast. Um, the, an Israeli company launched their first commercial swarming software. So that's for uh, operating swarms of drones to do things like agricultural or industrial surveys or search and rescue. Um, but there's a lot of work in different parts of the American military and the Chinese military in terms of putting together swarms of drones that will be useful um, not just for scouting and for finding the opponent, but also carrying out attacks on them autonomously. So the main advances that we need are in terms of uh, software, basically, and probably computing power within the drone itself. So the drone itself needs to be uh, needs to carry out all the computation required to behave within a, a swarm. So you don't want to use you don't want to use maybe external communication systems like you don't want to use maybe GPS, you don't want to use a, a central control uh, station, you want to do everything with, within the drone. Exactly, you want to have as much of the processing carried out on the drone as possible. Uh, and that one of the things that's helping with that a lot at the moment is so-called neuromorphic computing, which again uh, is copying from biological systems. Uh, and those are the buzzwords like deep learning gets thrown around a lot. That's just a very efficient algorithmic method of doing things like recognizing objects uh, or learning how to fly, for example, could be done by a, a deep learning system. Uh, and because there's a lot more neuromorphic chips coming onto the market, that's greatly increasing the, the capability for this type of drone. We even have them in, the, in some mobile phones, right? Uh, yep, yeah, exactly. The uh, the last two or three Apple phones have had these uh, bionic chips in them, which have a uh, a dedicated deep learning processor as part of them, and that makes them supposedly thousands or millions of, in, of times more efficient than uh, a normal digital computer for doing things like facial recognition or converting text to speech. So what are the current capabilities of uh, adversary countries, if we can call them adversary countries? I mean, I'm talking about uh, Russia and China. because uh, well, in, in terms of their swarming drones? Yes. Uh, well, the Chinese military uh, have flown um, what they say is the, the largest ever swarm uh, of small drones, and they're certainly looking at uh, using that type of swarm as a way of countering America's advantage uh, in particular items so they're looking at drone swarms to neutralize American aircraft carriers and air bases, for example, uh, and that's highly significant. Uh, on the battlefield, the Chinese recently um, showed video of a barrage drone launcher, which is a vehicle that can fire off up to 48 drones at a time. And they say that you can combine several of those so you can launch a swarm of 200 drones altogether uh, at an enemy target. And with existing air defences, 200 drones would completely overwhelm them. There's nothing currently that's uh, able to deal with that number of targets at once. But what happens when uh, the number becomes very high? Like I'm talking about uh, 10,000 drones or something like that. There was an article that spoke about uh, drones as a... Uh... Weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Yep, that's when drones get really scary when you start looking at thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of drones. Um, because in the, the simplest case, if you just have uh, a drone with an explosive warhead, each drone can kill one person. So a swarm of 10,000 drones can kill 10,000 people. And that's vastly more destructive um, than anything else in the inventory at the moment, um, simply because it, it's such... Uh, an efficient device as a, a killing machine. And there are arguments that drone swarms of that type should be legally counted as weapons of mass destruction and that there should be controls over them as there are with nuclear, chemical and biological weapons simply because they are so dangerous and because of the risk of proliferation. Because unlike nuclear weapons, which require a very 
advanced scientific establishment to develop. Anyone can develop a drone swarm um, and uh, simply acquire drones and the software and put explosives on them uh, and build bigger and bigger and more destructive swarms. So the, the potential is there even for relatively um, minor nations to have huge destructive power capable of killing um, very large numbers of civilians. Yeah, and there was a Netflix uh, show about that, I think. It was Black Mirror? Yeah, Black Mirror did an, did an episode about that. Um, there's also a video called Slaughterbots on YouTube, which was put out by the Campaign Against Autonomous Weapons, showing very much this idea and that if the technology of having small drones that can autonomously track down and kill people gets out there, uh, it will have almost unlimited potential for destruction. Um, though, in fact, simply drones attacking people may not be um, the worst aspect of it. What would be worse if you had smart drones which were able to do things like uh, start fires and attack industrial infrastructure, you could get um, much more damage done. Yeah. And what are the ideas at the moment in terms of uh, stopping uh, these uh, large uh, swarm drones? What, what, what are the ideas at the moment? Well, stopping them is, they're very difficult to stop one at a time, so individually shooting them down is challenging. Uh, one approach is using high-power microwave weapons, um, which effectively burn out the electronics. And uh, Raytheon have a system on that. The US Army have a, a system for that. Um, these are reasonably effective uh, at destroying electronics, and they've done very well in tests. Uh, what we don't know is how easily drones can be shielded against this sort of effect uh, and the potential for collateral damage. This technology has existed actually for many years, but one of the reasons why it's never been deployed is because of the risk that it could harm other electronics. Um, and the military is highly dependent on this sort of thing. Uh, and one reason why they won't ever put a, a microwave weapon on an aircraft is because of the risk of damaging some of the aircraft's own systems. Um, so there may very well be issues with that. Um, the other way is fighting a swarm with another swarm uh, and uh, having interceptor. There are already some interceptor drones out there, uh, and if you had a swarm of them, they would be able to take on an incoming swarm, particularly if they are smarter than the drones coming in and are able to anticipate what they're going to do. So you could have a situation uh, where your defenders were able to very efficiently take out the attacking drones. Um, but equally, you could have a situation where if the attackers are smarter, they might be able to evade the interceptors. So I think it's going to be very much a software race between attack and defense on that. Yeah, so it seems that, uh, I mean, that's that's the kind of uh, perception that uh, some people have, is that the ultimate uh, uh, battleground seems to be between rival software engineers, not between soldiers and pilot, basically. Uh, yeah, it's it's it, in many ways it is heading towards that situation. Yes. Did you see the Alpha Dog uh, trials? Uh, Alpha Dog uh, fight trials. Yeah. So, so this was um, seeing how well uh, a piece of software could compete against a, a human pilot, uh, and they. Uh, this is about the third year they've run it, uh, and so before it's just been the the different AI systems competing against each other. But this time around, they had the, the winner of that uh, in a simulation flying an F-16 against a highly trained human pilot uh, in a simulated F-16. And the, uh, the AI won five out of five rather easily. Uh, and there's a few questions about that and whether it's an accurate simulation and uh, whether that tells us anything about what would happen in the real world. But it certainly looks like the AI has got to a point where it's uh, highly competent at dogfighting. Everybody talks about AI. I would call it a machine learning because I, mean, I don't think there is much of intelligence in those things because those things do what software uh, engineers write them to do. They learn things, but uh, they don't take initiatives. Uh, for initiatives, we still have humans. The argument about uh, whether machine learning counts as AI or in fact what AI is uh, is going to go on for a while, I think. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a discussion that uh, that will certainly go on. But yes, but yeah, uh, there's an argument for saying it's not showing any real form of intelligence. It's just very good at what it does. And there was, there was also another thing about this dogfight, that they were using F-16 
they didn't they couldn't use like F35 because of uh, security or because of uh, I mean those F16 they are all the uh, fighter jets so yeah it's yeah it's it's a, an aircraft from the 1970s so uh, most they w- could share all the information about its performance very easily uh, whereas with the F35 or some of the more modern ones a lot of that is still secret uh, another interesting thing about the F-16 is that they've actually converted a number of the old F-16s for unmanned operation. Uh, and those are mainly there as aerial targets for air-to-air combat training. But if you've got a uh, an unmanned computer-controlled F-16, you could quite easily put your uh, AI, if you want to call it that, uh, dogfighting pilot in there and turn that into a robot dogfighter. You end up uh, in a situation like a Terminator or something like that. Yeah, but it's interesting. There's actually a, a follow-up to the Alpha dogfight because uh, people were saying that part of the problem was that the uh, the human pilot was doing everything he'd been trained to do, whereas the AI pilots were behaving like video gamers and they were just uh, using the system to its advantage. So there's actually going to be a, a rematch between the AI and uh, a human who's the winner of a gaming competition to see whether gamers are better than human pilots. So, David, I wanted to ask you one thing. Do you only co- do you mainly cover uh, stories from uh, USA? Do you cover the UK at all, or uh, I mean, do you do anything about? Um, yeah, I I I cover the world. You cover um, the world. US, UK, Russia, China. Yep. Um, but the Americans tend to be the best communicators. Uh, whereas, particularly for military stories, it's very difficult getting anything out of the establishment over here. Uh, okay, David. Thank you very much for uh, for doing this, and uh, yeah, I hope in the next time we won't have any pandemic, so we can meet here in uh, in Cambridge. That would be great if we could do that. Thanks yeah. very much. For Thank you me. very much.